Thank you, Eric, very much for that. I, like Bert, I thought I gave him a much more detailed description of my accomplishments, uh, <laughs> but uh, that, that's okay, Eric. We still love you. No. actual operational environment of DISCA look like or Homeland Defense look like. Bert certainly gave you his perspective this morning on Homeland Defense and what it looked like and he metaphorically tied it up or in definition tied it up as complacency and we'll talk a little bit about if what I think or my perspective of Homeland Defense here towards the latter part of this presentation. But what I want to start first is focusing on the Defense Support of Civil Authorities mission, as we've been doing a lot of it over the past 24 months. If you remember, two years ago, it started with Hurricane Harvey, then Hurricane Irma, then Hurricane Maria, then we had Hurricane Florence, and then we had Hurricane Michael, and now we're in this border security mission that we're doing along the southwest border, which, by the way, is DISCA. It's Defense Support of Civil Civilian Law Enforcement Organizations and not necessarily Defense Support of FEMA, which is naturally the catastrophic disasters. So when I talk in terms of operational environment, I'll be talking a lot about institutional, what I would call institutional factors of the operational environment. It drives how we operate within uh, the confines of our left and right limits. And I'll start with, what is DISCA? This is where it's supposed to be a discussion, right? Is that <laughs> back and forth. What, what is that mean? What, why, what I've tried to think as the planner or the chief of plans of the Army North is when I hear people say, oh, this is so difficult. I can't believe how difficult DISCA is. I find myself saying, well, why? What, why do you think DISCA, why, what is it? Why is it so difficult? Why is it so, isn't it one of the four types of Army operations? Offense, defense, stability, DISC, DISCA is in there, right? It's in the manual. Isn't it? I mean. If you look at ADP, ADRP 3-0 operations, it's one of the four types of operations is DISC. I can't figure out why this is so difficult. It's in our doctrine. We have manual, the FM 328, that covers defense support of civil authorities, tells you, hey, this is how we're going to do it, et cetera, et cetera. So I constantly sit back and say, why is it so difficult? And then I was thinking as I was coming up here, well, let me go back and really look at these doctrinal references. And so I tore open ADP 3.0, ADRP 3.0, and I figured out why it's so difficult. Because though it's written in there, right, as one of the four Army operations, when you look at the principles and tenets of Army operations, you can't execute any of those while conducting DISCA because you're restrained. How are you restrained? You look at the doctrine and guidance and et cetera from all the different things that are authorities that are out there to conduct a mission. For instance, if you don't know, there's a CJCS XORD on DISCA. It provides the forces to the combatant commander, certain types of forces, in case he needs to, or she, in this previous case, General O'Shaughnessy in now's case, needs to use forces for DISCA. It provides limitations on what you can use those forces for. And then if you're not satisfied with that, there's DOD, DOD directives, DOD instructions, there's joint publications, there's joint manuals, et cetera, et cetera, on defining DISCA, what it is, what the limitations are, what forces are kind of set aside for it, and et cetera. But when you look at the tenets and principles of Army operations, and you know what they are, you can't, or even look at the elements of operational design. As a commander conducting DISCA, you're limited in what you can do. And this is the dilemma that General O'Shaughnessy faces, that General Buchanan faces as the JFLIC commander. And so who is he interacting with to make this happen? And if you look at um, the structure, 
we say it starts at the combatant command, but really it starts in OSD with the, Bert put it up there, the, the uh, DASD for uh, DISCA and Global Security Affairs, who in this case I think is uh, Mr. Salasis. Is that right, Bert? Yep. And Mr. Salasis, Bob Salasis, is very interested in this mission. He very much wants to see uh, a high rate of success because who are we really doing this mission for? It's our own citizens within our country in and of itself. So there's a lot of stimulation that occurs at the very highest levels of government, even from the President of the United States. If you remember in Maria, if you had a chance to watch the TV at the time, General Buchanan was down there. and. The president actually shows up, and General Buchanan has an opportunity to meet with the president and actually talk to General Kelly, the chief, and receive some very good guidance on what uh, the president was wanting to happen for Maria, and that is make it better. And that's the kind of strategic guidance that you get when you're at that level in government. And so he was working to make it better. But how does he do that with all these various partners that Bert was pointing out in his presentation today? I've told you about some of the strategic documents that guide his ability or the commander's ability to conduct DISCA, but who is he doing it with? If you hear General Buchanan, one of his main mantras is unity of effort. Everything that he, we do in our command is to achieve unity of effort in order to protect lives, save lives, and prevent human suffering and prevent great or mitigate property damage, et cetera. That's the commander's intent in all of our DISCA missions. And who does he do that with? He does that with a number of different agencies, a number of different commands, and especially with the states and National Guard. General Buchanan talks to the dual status commanders you heard about earlier in uh, Bert's presentation. They come to Fort Sam for a portion of their dual status commander's course. And in that dual status commander's course, General Buchanan talks to him about, hey, it's unity of effort. That's what we're trying to achieve. The department, when the federal government calls for the Department of Defense to respond to a defense support or a disaster, it's not because the capabilities aren't necessarily resident. It's just that we want to get as much capability in there to save as many lives as we possibly can. And to do that, we have to work together as a team with all the different agencies, National Guard, FEMA, uh, local authorities, state authorities, et cetera. And in this particular case in Hurricane Harvey, uh, well, we'll fast forward to Hurricane, um, this year, Hurricane Florence. Two states affected, North Carolina and South Carolina. In North Carolina's case, they required a lot of assistance. They were requesting a lot of assistance. But in South Carolina's case, they weren't requesting any assistance. As a matter of fact, they didn't even want to appoint a dual status commander. But why do you think that is? We were lucky to have uh, members of our Joint Enabling Capabilities Team out of Transcom come down to our headquarters and help us in the planning process and execution process. One of the guys did a little study on how many first responders are available to these states, North Carolina and South Carolina. South Carolina, as a preponderance, has more first responders per capita than any other state in the union. And so when you look at it, we were I was letting the boss know, hey, look, I don't think South Carolina is going to request any assistance. They were very proactive in what they were doing. And they're going to be able to handle the flooding that was occurring up around the, uh, I guess, the northeast portion of the state without any federal assistance. Regardless of that, the, the political pressure on the state was really forcing them to appoint a dual status commander. They finally did, but they never requested any Title X DOD support. All that support was really going up to uh, North Carolina. So there's documents out there that guide what we can do. We work with a host of federal partners in accomplishing these DISCA type of missions, in particular the di disaster um, response missions. And then who do we use to execute the missions? So the, there are forces that are what you would call allocated in the DISCA CJCS DISCA Response Exord. But there are forces assigned to U.S. Army North and to the Combatant Command U.S. NORTHCOM to conduct these missions. In the small group I just sat in, uh, one gentleman had uh, relations with one of the members of these groups, and it's called the Defense Coordinating Officer or Defense Coordinating Element. 
These are about a 10-person organization that's co-located in each of the 10 FEMA regions. And they are basically the first DOD members to respond to a disaster that is requiring federal assistance, if you will. So when FEMA, they have an incident management and assessment team, gets activated to deploy to gain understanding of an incident, the DCO immediately activates and deploys with that IMAT team to start to gain situational awareness and understanding for the department. And they become the number one defense liaison officer for the secretary uh, in all disasters. There's 10 of them located in each of the 10 FEMA regions. They'll be the first ones that, that go in. And then second to that, we have, if you remember a couple of years ago, all the ASCCs were stood up with internal um, JTF-like capabilities. They had their internal JTF they could push out. And then a couple years after, uh, they were told to strip all that out and to save uh, position. We all had to take a pretty large cut in personnel. Our commander at the time said, no, I'm not going to do that because this organization is important to me. So he retained the capability to push out a, what he likes to talk about as a forward element. So after the DCO deploys, we'll deploy a JFLIC forward, as we like to call it, to continue to gain situational awareness and understanding for the boss, but also to start to set the conditions to receive follow-on forces. And this is very important because Bert introduced two terms to you today, ROE versus rough. So in the United States, we don't use ROE. We just use rough. There is no, we don't employ ROE in terms of land, homeland defense, or land operations. It's just the rules of the use of force. So what this capability does is it moves forward with a robust staff in order to conduct those reception, staging, and armored integration tasks that are necessary to, to set forces up for success so that when they're employed, they're kind of aware of what's going on, aware of who they're going to be working for, and are going to be set up to be successful. Not always the case, but that's definitely the intent. We also have an active component expeditionary sustainment command, which is critical, critical to our success. They deploy what's called a situational assessment team pretty early on in the process to let the commander of that expeditionary sustainment command understand what the demands are going to be for the sustainment of forces flowing in to support the disaster. And that includes for our current operation on the border as well. That sustainment command is down there as well. We also have an expeditionary signal battalion that has a really a tri-role, a homeland defense role, a DISCA role, and then a on prepare or on order role to support us with additional points of presence or voice video data capabilities as required. And then we have a sustainment brigade that really does some of the heavy lifting for the expeditionary sustainment command. And all these forces converge to set the conditions for forces to come in to conduct our actual DISCA operations. Now, Bert asked, uh, was asked a question earlier, what can you do as senior strategic leaders when you go out there uh, to prepare the community or prepare yourselves for support to the NORTHCOM AOR? And what I would say to that is be the best at what you're supposed to do. Because when we call you to do something, it's for that core capability that you present. If it's above and beyond your core capability, then you're going to be allocated well in advance and we'll train you up for the mission. But if you're not allocated to a NORTHCOM mission, what you can do for us is exactly what the chief wants you to do, which is be prepared to perform your core mission. And when FORCECOM calls you and says, hey, NORTHCOM needs you in their AOR to perform your mission, it's because we've studied and said we need that core capability and we need it now because there's lives depending on their ability to employ in this particular operation. Whether you're directly saving lives or indirectly saving them, if you're called for a NORTHCOM mission to do DISCA, it's really an inadvertently to save lives in some form or fashion. Just like in Harvey, it was the movement of uh, materials and supplies and so forth and actually conducting what I, I hate to use the term, but high water rescues 
Uh, I know there are no high water rescue vehicles in the Army, but now this term is caught on. And so the, uh, unfortunately, you'll see NORTHCOM and even in OSD use this term high water vehicles, which are really nothing more than uh, LMTV or something of that nature. But there were rescues conducted using the LMTVs and other type of equipment that saved lives in Houston. Now these disasters we get involved in are relatively huge, so let's put it in perspective. Hurricane Harvey, Houston, several hundred thousand people evacuated in a very short period of time. And when you think about that, how, how long does it take the department to move several hundred thousand soldiers? months. But in a matter of days, you had an organization in Houston move and evacuate several hundred thousand people. And that's because of the great planning of, from the local, the state, and the national level planners to prepare for these types of disasters. So we have the architecture of paperwork and authorities that allow us to do the mission. We have uh, the people that ha help us to do it. We have our partners that help us to do it. But we couldn't do it if we didn't practice, train, rehearse, do TTXs, et cetera. We have one national level exercise every year that prepares us as a community to respond to disasters. And that national level exercise, quite fortunately, usually falls in the spring right before hurricane season, you know, so that we're all prepared for something if it does happen. Now, for the longest time, it's always been focused on a hurricane. But you see uh, Mr. Tussing, Professor Tussing is having an effect out in the community. And so these exercises are supposed to coordinate with the other exercise that we do in the fall, which is another national level exercise on homeland defense. And so the exercise in the spring is supposed to be more of a global type of exercise testing multiple uh, agencies and multiple functions executing simultaneously that then feeds into the extra homeland defense exercise in the fall. We'll see how that goes. I don't, I don't, my hopes aren't high for this year, but, but maybe into the future. This year we're actually going to do the New Madrid seismic zone, so it should be interesting. So there's the paperwork and authorities that are out there, the laws, uh, and I just sat in a sem seminar that talked about posse comitatus, right? There's an act, and if you want to employ U.S. forces, Title X U.S. forces to conduct law enforcement, there has to be an exception to posse comitatus granted by who? The President. the President of the United States has to do that. So what I've learned over the past couple of months is, yes, there's a law, but lawyers can twist that to just about mean anything they want and present the President with alternatives that allow exceptions that may not be as crystal clear as you think they are, but in terms of legal jargon, we are performing law enforcement or are prepared to perform law enforcement on the southwest border right now under a granted exception of the Posse Comitatus Act by President Trump. So you have these authorities, we have personnel to do it. If we come into a situation where we require additional capability above and what, beyond what's on the CJCS exord, then we have to go through the same process of all the other combatant commands, which is request for forces. Typically, this is a lengthy process for most combatant commands. However, we found a way to kind of streamline it for ours, and we do that through a host of different venues. But one thing we do is send a LNO to Forcecom so that as soon as we realize that there's going to be a requirement, we can get that in the system even before all the VOCO hasn't occurred because the SECDEF still has to approve request for forces for NORTHCOM regardless. And it goes into the SDOB, and it's an out of cycle SDOB, et cetera. I don't want to get too administrative, administrative on you, but that's how that works. And we'll request those forces. And again, those forces come in. They, they aren't necessarily trained. They'll come in, they'll go through that JRSOI or RSOI process through our forward headquarters, and then they'll be employed, either working for a Title X commander or working for a Title 32 dual <laughs> status commander who's also a Title 10. Uh, I was sat in the seminar earlier and one gentleman was saying he received orders from that Title 32 officer, but those orders were actually created under his Title 10 hat. And those dual status commanders in the operation report to two chains of command. There's state chain of command and then the Title 10 chain of command, which in our case is General Buchanan. 
Now, when you look at employing the J flick or the theater army, which is what we are, we are a theater army assigned to NORTHCOM. The combatant commander doesn't have a lot of leeway in who, in this case, General Shaughnessy, is going to appoint as the headquarters in charge of an operation. They came out with this, you know, leave it up to, no offense to the Air Force, but they always like to create new acronyms, and they created this command, uh, control, and coordination document that kind of lays out how they visualize command um, in their theater of operation. And they created this template that under these circumstances, it's going to be a JTF. In these circumstances, it's going to be a JFLIC. In these circumstances, it'll be the JFAC for Homeland Defense, et cetera. What we learned out in Maria is that doesn't really work out so well, you know, because the Navy isn't really capable of transitioning quickly from sea-led operations to land-based operations. Um, and therefore, they employed, it was actually quite funny at the time. General Kim was our deputy commander, and General Buchanan our commander during uh, Hurricane Maria. Uh, as you know, during that first week, we were taking a very, uh, we were exhaling and breathing because we were just got over Harvey, Harvey and Irma, and we thought, oh, the Navy's got this Maria. We don't have to worry about it. We'll just send a little bit of Army capability. Seven days into it, they're struggling. The whole syst response system is struggling because even FEMA and DHS are strung out from Harvey, Irma, Unga, fires. Every DCO we had was employed except for one, and then we had Maria on top of that. So you had two basically DCOs deployed in that area, one in Puerto Rico and the other in the Virgin Islands. They were trying to help the Navy out, but they had only a Marine battalion that was during the day, the Marine Battalion would go on land, cut a few trees, move a few things, and then at night they would go back to the ship. This wasn't working very well with the amount of supplies and everything that needed to get around in Maria. So at that particular time, I was going home that evening, and by the time I got home that Friday, I saw in the news, General deploys to Puerto Rico to take charge of the situation. By the time I got to work the next day, General Kim, who was that general, was being replaced. Now it was Lieutenant General deploys. So within a 24-hour period, the political pressure was so much on that particular situation that we went from a General Kim deploying to General Buchanan deploying, and deploying as the J Flick commander. Now understand the political pressure at this time in Maria's response there was pressure for Buchanan to take charge of the situation, to be that guy that uh, Professor Tussing was talking about. He's the one with all the stars. He's the guy people want to look to. He's the one that's going to do it. But credit to him, he didn't do that. His very first report um, interview, I'm here to support the lead federal agency and support the recovery in Puerto Rico. I'm not here to take charge. I'm here to support. He got a lot of flack for that from the senior leaders, both in uh, really at that time in the Army. Because if anybody knows General Milley, General Milley's like, get down there and get in charge and so forth and XO, you know. But uh, he showed great restraint and did what he needed to do to properly frame the DISCA response for the DOD in that particular case. And there's a RAND report that's going to come out on that. And I agree with uh, Professor Tussing that we're not necessarily talking about a catastrophic, catastrophic event in Puerto Rico. It was catastrophic to the individuals in Puerto Rico, but not catastrophic to the nation in that it didn't have cascading effects that affected our critical infrastructure, et cetera. But it was obviously catastrophic to the uh, natures or what was occurring in Puerto Rico. Um, people, authorities, we have capabilities. Why didn't the combatant commander, at that time it was General Robinson, nominate General Buchanan to be a joint task force commander instead of a, remaining as a joint force land component commander in response to Puerto Rico? We had Marines, we had Navy, we had Air Force, Army, all working 
to resolve or make it better in Puerto Rico, all working in conjunction with each other. And what General Buchanan likes to call almost friend con at that point, because he was down there. He, there was no real professional relationship between the organization. There was some take on associated, but mainly it, there was, he was limited in what he could tell those other organizations to do. It didn't impede his ability to conduct the response, because if you know him, you know he's a pretty debonair kind of guy. He can talk to people. He gets to know you. He lets you know it's all about unity of effort. We're here to do the same thing. And the other general officers down there, they all got along and worked together really closely. And FEMA had a good team down there as well, even though it was kind of a, uh, like I said, a pickup team. So why wasn't he nominated as a JTF instead of a Joint Force Land Component Commander? Anybody have an idea? Certainly the dual status commander when you get into that discussion and unfortunately in Puerto Rico there was a dual status commander uh, but he immediately took leave at, uh, you know, at, uh, when it happened and, and they had to appoint another one and then that individual was working hard um, to but understand the state of the Puerto Rican National Guard at the time. They were spread to the four, even the reserve units that we had there. They were trying to recover their families and et cetera, et cetera. So they weren't in depth or really into the response in and of itself. So we were trying to fetter out or flesh out who the dual status commander was going to be, how those units were going to be employed, how we could actually consolidate those units into a, a response force, if you will. And that took a long time. But in the meantime, uh, the NORTHCOM command and control and coordination document said, under these circumstances, we're going to appoint a JTF. And that document led right into, and I'm sure they would argue that it wasn't the case, but it should, in my opinion, have been a JTF in accordance with their document. So why a joint task force? So Joint Pub 333 lays out everything the joint task force is supposed to be, do, say, whatever, et cetera. Joint Pub 331 lays out everything that a Joint Force Land Component Commander is supposed to do. Well, remember, you can tailor that JTF for the mission. You don't necessarily need all the parts and pieces to it. We already had the Joint Enabling Capability Team out of the JEC, the Transcom JEC, so that plus us up with all the joint capability, or at least the staff portion, right? So in essence, what's the difference between a JFLIC and a JTF? So you have to be pretty steeped in doctrine to understand, you know, uh, the, the difference. Go. Okay, so the integration is probably a good argument to make, right? So a joint task force commanders can integrate forces because they're joint. And joint in nature means that they have, like this gentleman saying, if you look at the doctrine in Joint Pub 1, and it says this is how a JTF is laid out. You have an Army service component, a Navy service component, Marine service component, Air Force service component. So a JTF should have could align by service or they could align functionally as a, another G, a subordinate GIF flick, subordinate JFAC, subordinate GIF MIC, right? Well, that's essentially what General Buchanan had in Maria is a JFAC with the first Air Force, um, I think the SAR coordination element, they call it or whatever, led by two star. He had a Navy one star um, down there and then he had uh, Marines down there as well, and then of course he had the Army capabilities. So in essence, from a staff perspective and a functional perspective, we were organized as a joint task force. However, there was resistance to name him a joint task force commander. The resistance was coming from the Beltway. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but there was resistance from 
the highest levels of our government to nominate us as a joint task force at that time. And I think that it probably bleeds into this gentleman's response over here a little bit in that, oh, well, you have to, people think you have to resource, you have to do this. You all of a sudden start to get joint credit for that assignment, joint awards for that assignment, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm not sure the exact reason, but we were remained a J, joint force land component command regardless in that particular response and regardless of our current response on the border, where we have Marines working for us, Air Force working for us, Army working for us right now on the border. We're still a Joint Force Land Component Command. I think right now, as I, as I talk to people, and the one thing I wanted to hit is, you know, understand these nuanced differences between these organizations. Get steep as a strategic leader into the doctrine that's out there right now. Joint Pub 1 is definitely one that everybody should be very familiar with and how these different organizations are supposed to formulate and form, form and then execute in their day-to-day -day operations. Understand the differences between a JTF and a JFLIG. Though there were limitations on what General Buchanan could do, he went back through the combatant command and asked for exceptions so that Joint Force Land Component Commander, he could still have the authority to do certain things that a JTF would be able to, the JTF commander would be able to do. But I can tell you that one of the things that if, if you look at his AAR comments, it is that I was not a Joint Task Force Commander in that particular mission. I'm not sure what he would say right now on the border mission. I think he's really comfortable right now. We've been at it for a few months. But he may, in reflection, say the same thing. Because as a Joint Task Force Commander, having units opcon to you, it gives you much more control over when and where they do their missions. And you don't have to be, um, you don't have to spend a lot of time formulating those relationships, nurturing them, and et cetera, et cetera. You have the, the, rela the command authority to have folks do business. And so that's DISCA, the operational environment as a whole. But there's tensions in that system that exist, right? It starts at the local level. What do we have local politicians for? I mean, in the city of San Antonio, we have an emergency management system in San Antonio, where I live day in, day out, in Houston, et cetera. In the state, there's an emergency management system. The tension is, well, politicians don't like to often say, when you're starting to plan for a response, they don't like to say, hey, I can't do that. I can't do my job to protect my citizens. And so they're apt not to be as forthright or as open about the needs in certain scenarios because it shows that they haven't planned properly or they haven't resourced properly, they haven't prioritized properly. And that extends all the way to the state. And so poor FEMA, as the, if you look at uh, Homeland Security Presidential Directive 8 that charges FEMA, or DHS, to do this coordinated planning for all these disasters, they're trying to go down into the states and into the local level to plan for catastrophic events. But the tension exists at the local and state level that they don't really want to tell FEMA what their requirements are. Their typical response is, we're going to be good. We don't need anything. When in fact, they're not. I mean, in a major catastrophic event, even in a state like Texas, for Hurricane Harvey required support. And if it's not, you, you end up doing some Fed to Fed. You will require some type of support in a major catastrophic event. So there's a tension in the planning process. But there's also a tension in execution. There's tensions between the active component and the National Guard. Because the National Guard, that's their state. They're working there every day. It's their people who are being affected. They don't want to give up control of an operation. They don't even want to be a dual status commander. They want to handle it themselves through the emergency management compact agreements that the states reach out with. But in fact, the active component can sometimes respond more quickly than the National Guard. Not, not for those that are in the state, obviously, but when you start bringing in National Guard assets from outside the state, sometimes the, national, the active component can respond more quickly. And there's a tension with the National Guard and the active component thinking that the active component's coming in here to take over. And that's just not the case. All we're trying to do is fill what we are being told is a need in the system that exists or in the environment. And that's why General Buchanan's main 
mantra during the course and when talking with National Guard is that, hey, this is a unity of effort. And even though if you're a title uh, dual status commander in that case and you're going to res respond to me, I'm really there supporting you and your state's needs. This worked really well in um, Hurricane Harvey because prior to Harvey, Texas was one of the states that said, I'm not going to have a dual status commander. We're just not going to do it. And uh, we can handle everything ourselves. You know, it's, it is the only state that it houses an entire division within its borders. It houses the most powerful core on the face of the earth. I could go on and on. It is the home of the Alamo, uh, et cetera. You know, I am from Texas, so I can tell you all how great it is. But um, the bottom line is Texas didn't want to do, didn't want to appoint a dual status commander. But they did because the need was there. And they did it on the fly. The, Without having all the additional training and et cetera, et cetera, they appointed the one star at the time as the dual status commander. And General Buchanan immediately reached out to him, had a meeting with him, and put him at ease that we're there to support. So I do want to make sure that we reiter reiterate that in a disaster, if the active component is called to assist, we're there really to support the recovery or the response to save lives, prevent human suffering, and mitigate great property damage. So a lot to do with uh, that particular set right there. So it was a really busy last year, you know, with Harvey, Irma, Maria, and you know, for a few years before that, we were at Army North going, man, well, there's not much going on, which is a good thing, right? You know, th that means people are doing well. It's not, disasters are at a very at a very moderate level, and um, we're like, there's no way that we're going to have another hurricane season. Just, no, no possible way. And we started to really prepare for three years in a row, well, actually two years in a row, our fall exercise, which is our homeland defense exercise, we've had to like put on the side burner. So after Harvey, Irma, and Maria, we're, going, we're, we're all into the homeland defense exercise. The whole headquarters is starting to gear up. And then all of a sudden, Florence starts coming in, you know? And we're like, what? You've got to be kidding me. This is happening again. But Florence starts heading in and really lay, lays hat, does kind of the same thing that Harvey did to Texas, Florence does to North and South Carolina. Uh, sticking around a long time, huge rain event, not necessarily a wind event, and causes us to respond again. And then Michael streams by and destroys Konar, AF North, there in Tyndall Air Force Base, along with some other organizations and um, terrain, et cetera, but it was a wind event and didn't really require a lot of response from the, from the federal government. So we're thinking, okay, thank, we'll be able to get back to this homeland defense exercise. And then we started to hear rumblings of a request for assistance from DHS to support border security. Now, if you don't know, this happens a lot. This border security mission <coughs> Reinforcing it happens all, the, it happens every year. Last year, I was up at Northcom with our G3, and the J35 comes down with his hair on fire. We need to deploy 4,000 people to the border right now. How are we going to do it, Dave? You know, and the G3 turns to him and says, I have no idea. What are they going to do? You know, and we went through this, this discussion for a while, but it ends up that that became Operation Guardian Support, which is a National Guard mission. Not, Historically, every year, the mission of border security comes up, it defaults to the National Guard. So when we started to hear rumors of this request for assistance from DHS, we're thinking, oh, this is going to be a National Guard mission. No, no worries, guys. You know, we'll do some planning, et cetera, et cetera, but I'm pretty sure this is going to end up in the National Guard's lap. Uh, to much to my surprise, within a 24-hour period, it was decided it wasn't going to be a National Guard. It was going to be active duty. Our North, what's your plan? And luckily, we were working on something. And I think it was that same day, by 11 PM at night, I was briefing General Buchanan, hey, here's going to be the plan. Here's where we're going to lay out forces. Here's going to be a sustainment. Here's going to be you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here, the communications plan and the operational environment and et cetera. He's like, OK, great. Let's go with it. So that went, went up to Northcon that night. And then over to the Joint Staff the next day, forces requested that, that particular day automatically to deploy to the border. 
And we went through all these different uh, scenarios uh, of deploying these forces along the border. But at this point, there's no approved request for assistance. And so the two ways this normally happens is either through the Stafford Act or through the Economy Act. And normally the Stafford Act is a national disaster, and then the Economy Act is a agency to agency request. So typically, if the DHS was turning to DOD for border security, they would do it under the Economy Act, which means that the DOD gets reimbursed for all their money. This particular request specifically stated will come with no funding, which means that the Department of Defense will absorb all the costs associated with the mission. As I mentioned, within a 24-hour period, we're ordering forces, but we're, we still don't really know what they're supposed to do because all we did was receive a first draft of a request for assistance from DHS. And that draft was like, I don't know, three or four pages long. The tasks were broken down into different functional areas and included some things that were obviously we could not do because of the, there was no, at that time, no exception to posse cumitatis granted. So this request for assistance bounced around between DHS headquarters, DOD headquarters, I think the executive office for a while until it finally came out that, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to re hard, uh, the, the term at that time was harden the POEs. Now understand how difficult this actually is. Professor Tussing showed you the display of unity of effort for Homeland Defense. How many agencies are involved in border security? Anybody have any idea? You would think Customs and Border Protection, right? They're the agency that's responsible for border security. Well, in fact, there are three agencies that coordinate operations for border security. The Office of Field Operations is responsible for the POEs. The Border Patrol is responsible for everything between the POEs. The Office of Air and Marine is responsible for coordinating support to the Border Patrol or to OFO for operations. And all of that is done through directors in the field via FRINCON. That means the three directors, Air and Marine, OFO, and Border Patrol get together and design a plan and say, hey, will you guys, let's all support this together. That's how operations are conducted along the border. So you had this RFA that, where is it being created? At headquarters in DC. You would think that the field is providing information to DC. How many people think that the RFA that was being generated in DC is being generated based on the requirements from the OFO, Border Patrol, and Air and Marine directors in the field? Absolutely not. They're doing their own thing up there while the field is doing their own thing down here. And so they finally hammered out after, I don't know, three or four iterations of this RFA bouncing around the beltway, a legitimate request for assistance. We were, luckily, we were on top of it, already ordered forces against it. We were able to deploy forces into the field to basically, for this phase, harden the POEs. And that was a great thing. I mean, it was, but it was very, understand the consternation that was occurring at the very highest levels of government because nobody wanted these folks to do law enforcement. You cannot do law, I think there was a discussion at the very highest levels on whether we were even gonna deploy them with weapons or not. But General Buchanan said we will deploy them with weapons, there's no doubt about it. Because the way the RFAs were going is Border Patrol wanted us to be able to do law enforcement. And you never knew what was going to happen and so, at the very least, we pushed for the ability to deploy with weapons. And then we started to hear about a second RFA that was bantering about. And this was the Border Patrol and OFO pushing back on the headquarters saying, hey, we really want the ability to use military forces to protect our forces that are on the line. And this is you know, law enforcement, basically. And this RFA goes bouncing around the Beltway a lot, and we're trying to figure out, okay, how do you actually do this without an exception to Fossi Comitatus? This is where the president kind of weighs in, and the lawyers weigh in, 
And there's actually an exception uh, to preserve the functions of government. The president can authorize an exception to posse comitatus. And what the lawyers argued was that the overwhelming nature of the caravans at that time could overwhelm a POE, therefore disrupting the government's ability uh, to function. And that became the argument the lawyers rested on for that exception that was granted. And then we went into creating the orders process to order forces. Luckily, the forces we had in there, uh, Marines and Army, were already prepared to do the mission because we allowed, it, allowed them to bring their weapons in the, in the first phase or the first RFA. So the only transition was is how they were going to do it. And they went about that by getting with the port directors and the Border Patrol directors to understand how they were going to reinforce their operations at the ground level. Now understand from a planner's perspective, I didn't like this at all because I didn't have a good feeling about this. I didn't like this. I thought this should have been from the very highest levels of government should have orchestrated a very clear left and right limit for these soldiers and Marines that we were putting on the border. But there were orders that left our headquarters that I couldn't tell them exactly what they were going to do because the only person that knew exactly what they were going to do or what they needed them to do were on the ground. And they were the port director or the office of field operations director and which at that time in the west was Flores or it was Chief Padilla in the east in Texas at that time. And they were the ones that negotiated, hey, how the DOD was going to employ forces to conduct law enforcement as the exception of posse comitatus uh, for that particular mission. Very complicated. And then we started to get rumblings of another RFA, RFA number three that was coming up. RFA three was for additional fencing. And uh, not too substantive, right? Pretty easy. And we go ahead and process RFA number three. It gets approved and we start executing RFA number three. And now there's an RFA number four that's out there. So what was initially supposed to be a mission for 45 days was extended for another 45, is now looking that it could extend months into the future. Now, what they're asking us to do is gonna require probably, you know, depending on what happens, another exception by the president, but we'll, we'll see. But the border security mission, is different from the disaster response because we didn't deploy any DCOs. We didn't necessarily deploy a huge sustainment architecture because they didn't quite need as much as they would need in a disaster response. All the facilities and infrastructure that we were putting folks into it already existed. So in, in the case of deploying folks out west, we used military bases to house, feed, and et cetera. Now, the Air Force pushed back on this initially, but they were eventually ordered by the Joint Staff to provide the support. It was only kind of in Texas that we had to create a FOB uh, for uh, the unit that we put into Texas to support the uh, different um, POEs in, in this. They're all in the state of Texas. And then we had a slight log pack that sustained them over time. Um, other than that, the other difference is that uh, the authorities for supporting law enforcement are obviously different than what you would do in a DISC environment. So the authorities that we use to employ forces in support of law enforcement is the one that stands out. The big limitation is the Posse Comitatus Act. Obviously, it applies un under um, a disaster response, but you're not necessarily taking weapons to disaster response. You're not really worried about conducting law enforcement disaster response. You're saving lives and doing those other things. So the authorities are kind of different. The doctrine, there's a different DOD directive than for supporting law enforcement than there is for disaster response. There's a, though they, they're nuanced and they feed into each other, there's separate ones. There's separate doctrine for it, et cetera. So this is very, as a planner and then as an operator at our level, when it comes down to execution, not so much important, but at our level, we have to make sure that it's very clear what those left and right limits are 
before we order forces in to do the particular mission. So a big difference in disaster response and defense support of uh, law enforcement agencies. In this case, it was OFO, Border Patrol, and the Air Marine. So, do you have a, a large question for you. Okay. So the question was, did we reflect on the first Bush presidency's war on drugs as included as part of the exception? And I do not believe that they ever tried to use the opioid crisis uh, to fulfill or to authorize an exception to posse comitatus. They may have had that discussion up there, but I'm not aware of the using, and I assume you're talking about the opioid crisis because most of the materials that make the narcotic come through Mexico into the U.S. But in that case, I'm not aware of it. I've been talking before that we talked about narco-terrorism in 1970. So I would need you to... agreement with South America and what's on the ground. That's how it was agreed. Yeah, well, I'm not sure what Southcom was doing. Obviously not much because they the caravans went through their territory pretty quickly. Uh, there is this seam along the border, uh, the southern Mexico border, that I think when G uh, Admiral Stravidius was commander of Southcom, really wrote extensively about. They haven't, uh, I don't know if we've actually solved it. I don't know if it actually kind of exists. If you know anything about <laughs> southern Mexico, the Chiap state of Chiapas, it's very uh, poor, very poor area. It's very tough terrain to kind of navigate through uh, from Central America to try to transition through Chiapas because there's not a lot of resources to sustain folks. Uh, very difficult to, to do that. So uh, we did not go to the length of looking at that that you suggest. Um, the transnational criminal organizations that they're looking at right now, that war that's ongoing is really not we support that fight, we're not in charge of that fight, if that makes sense. Professor Tustin. Yeah, the, the students were in Puerto Rico, they asked us a lot of questions. One of the things I think is important for agencies that are looking at this too is the intersection between RFA versus the uh, Free Trade and Mexico Party. Uh, are, are we trying to encroach on the gap there? So, Professor Tustin asked a question about the difference between an RFA or request for assistance and what's called a prescripted mission assignments. If you don't know, FEMA has a book of prescripted mission assignments. I think there's 200 and something, of which 28 belong to the DOD. They're relatively outdated. The only thing that's beneficial about the prescripted mission assignment is that the language is already in there, and supposedly there's a cost associated with the support. What I mean by dated, the, they haven't been, I think they've been scrubbed, but they haven't been updated Maybe they've been updated in DDAS, but I don't know if the, the costs have been updated in, a, in several years. And as you know, the cost, we're mainly talking about the cost of airframes, and, and helicopters, blade hours. This is a huge uh, capability that the department brings, and it is a huge cost to our partners. Now, there is no real correlation between the request for assistance and the prescriptive mission assignment other than if, they re, if our federal partner requests a capability and that capability is one of those 28, it expedites the paperwork that has to be filed to, to do it. That, that's about it. Um, other than that, there's uh, no other real correlation. Now, I think what needs to happen and what DHS and the DOD have done, tried to do several times is go back and redo these 28 prescripted mission assignments. Um, but if you know anything about the DDAS or the system that's used of record to record these requests and record the costs and so forth, it, um, it, a lot of these things are already in there. So you can, if you're, and you would never have to do this, but if you're a member of the DCE or you are a defense coordinating officer out there, your folks are going into DDAS or DHS is going into DDAS, plugging in the capabilities, what the task is required to do, and how much is associated. 
I'll talk one thing about this, and it's kind of administrivia, but it's relevant, and that is how you word the capability. And this is relevant to if you go out to be a commander or uh, in, in a joint task force, a JFLIC, whatever, is what do you ask for? The joint, do you say, hey, I need a truck capability, or I need a truck unit, I need this, I need that. That's your inclination is I need this. What the joint staff wants to hear is what it's supposed to do. And that helps them to prioritize when they get requests in at the joint staff J35 South is to be able to say, okay, this takes priority because it presents the greatest amount of risk. If all that you say on your requirement entry is I need a truck company, then you're probably going to drop to the lowest of the list. Has to be really spelled out on what that truck company is supposed to do. We only have a couple more minutes and then I have to wrap it up. Speaking of RFAs and costs, you had said earlier that DOD was sporting the cost for this operation. What about RFA number three and the materials used for that? Does that get billed back to DOD as well? Yes. Yes. Everything happening on the southwest border right now is being borne by the department. So everything that they're providing uh, in support of the DHS border security mission is being borne by the Department of Defense. Yes, sir. Have you seen any requests to change the low speed use of force coming up from the commanders that are on the ground? So we have not. I mean, in, in point blank. And luckily, because they haven't really had to employ. Uh, if you don't know, there's this thing called law enforcement surge account, and they surged a bunch of law enforcement officers to the southwest border. And these are true federal law enforcement officers. And I'm not talking, I'm talking thousands of more uh, law enforcement personnel that they just inadvertently did right after Christmas and not right before, but anyway. Andrew Dieter at Seminar 22. Um, when I was at NORTHCOM five years ago, one of the, the main sustainment commands in the plan was the National Guard unit, and so we had trouble using that even in an exercise because of authorities. Is that still the case? And if it is, have we figured it out? So the Theater Sustainment Command was a National Guard, it was the 167th. It's been replaced by the 377th Theater Sustainment Command, which is a reserve unit. It's not a multi-compo, well, I think it is a multi-compo reserve unit, but we still have problems accessing compo two and three organizations for disaster response, because nobody wants to sign the mobilization order and own everything that's associated with that. So that's why we had an active duty expeditionary sustainment command we're transitioning to a multi-compo one, uh, so we'll kind of see how that goes. What, th see, the problem is that commander, that organization is not on orders day in and day out. So you can't tell that commander to do certain things. You know, General Buchanan can't turn to a multi-compo unit and tell that commander, in unless that commander's position is part of the multi-compo, which it generally is not, you know. So it's, it's kind of changed, but we still have a little bit of the same nuance problems. You're going to learn a lot over the, your time here. You've probably already learned it. You're going to fly through these next couple of months. One of the lessons that General Buchanan uh, has really taken to heart is understanding the operational environment. I probably didn't do that great of a job of describing uh, how difficult it is to operate in uh, our performing disaster response, but I promise you that it is. What I would honestly say, though, is that the NORTHCOM AOR is just as unique as every other AOR. They're all different. And this requires strategic leaders to take on a own personal point of study so that you understand both the institutional and geographic factors that are relevant to the operational area in which you're going to be assigned. I wish you a happy 2019, a successful career, and a wonderful life. Thank you. <laughs>